back with Legends Territory, Braun and Przinski, and thank you to our MLB Players Alumni Association partnership for setting up the best former player conversations. Also check out baseballalumni.com for more info on your favorite former players. And if you're watching this on YouTube, we've got the podcast version for you wherever you get your pods. Let's introduce our next guest, 14-year big leaguer coming through. Very timely on this one. He was inducted into the Rangers Hall of Fame in 2016. His number 10 was retired by the Rangers in 2019. Gold Glover, seven-time All-Star, current Rangers special advisor to the general manager, and he's going to get himself a little World Series ring. Michael Young has arrived. Michael, great to have you on, dude. Did you shed a tear when the Rangers won? A little bit, yeah. It's like good and bad tears, right? The happy tears for everyone that just did it and the bad tears for 2011 rearing its ugly head again in my memory bank. But uh, I was super pumped for everyone involved. I mean, when you have a team win the World Series, you see all the hard work put in. Obviously, by the players, first and foremost, it's about them. But then you see, like, the scouts and the front office and the, and the coaching staff and Boach, obviously. It just It was really cool, man. It's our first one. So uh, it was a really, really cool moment. Mikey, what what's your role with the Rangers now? Because I, you know, they kept showing you on TV up there hugging on Chris Young, you and Kinsler and Beltre. I'm like, man, all these dudes. I either well, I played with Kinsler and AB. I didn't get to play with you, sadly. Right. But you know, these guys, you guys are all up there, you know, hanging around Chris Young. What, what's your exact role with the Rangers? Special assistant to the GM, but it's uh, it's kind of a hybrid thing. I mean, it goes from you know being involved when they when they go into trade talks, free agency. Right now, we're in our pro scouting meetings. Um, and then we'll go through what our potential targets are for the off season. And then when the season starts, it's obviously getting to see some affiliates go down to double A AA and triple A, which is what I usually do during the season. Uh, see them in spring training, get a chance to talk to the young kids, which is usually the best part, right? When you see them in the minor leagues and see what they can, if you can give them anything that can help them on their, on their path to the big leagues and not just get into the big leagues. I mean, AJ, you know, it's, Every minor leaguer says they want to get here, but a lot of guys get here. It's about staying here and being really good here, and that's the really that's the toughest part. So if we can do anything to help them out along the way, uh, that's a ton of fun on our end. Hey, just admit you got the best job in the world, dude. You go oh you go to <laughs> Double A and Triple A. I mean, you you live in Dallas. Frisco's what twenty minutes maybe from downtown Dallas. You know, Round Rock's not very far. Nope. I mean, you got the best job. You're like, oh wait, I'm not going to Hickory. I'm not going to. <laughs> You know, wherever. I don't even know where the down east wood ducks are, but I mean, low way, but I mean, oh, yeah, you're, oh, yeah. Sorry. Hey, see why? You need me to check a team out? Oh, I'll go to Frisco for the next week. Yeah, That's exactly time. right. Yeah. yeah. Jack, Jack Leiter's pitching in Frisco. You want to go check him out? Yeah, I'll ride my bike over there and check him out. It's, it's, pretty, <laughs> it's pretty nice, dude. Uh, I, I, honestly, like you said it, man, it is a, it is a great job. And I give, uh, the Rangers have been so great. Um, I can't ask for anything more to so, to be involved in this and then be when I, like you mentioned, when we go to the world series and I was there with Adrian and Ian, um, I think for us, we go just to support everyone who's dumped, you know, blood, sweat and tears in this thing. That was the fun part. It's like seeing our scouts, like super excited, our front office, obviously and just to be there and, and be supportive of that group was, was pretty damn cool, man. So what stood out to you about the transactions from the Rangers over the past, I would say, especially a couple years that have yeah. put this together? I know that, you know, the foundation goes back for a while, uh, of course, with the John Daniels era as well. But like what's stood out to you that you guys can take heading into this offseason? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is when you look at like everything else you want to be, you have to develop from within. So you look at Josh Young having a huge year, Evan Carter. Then you look at the trades like Jonah Heim and getting a dolus for basically nothing and have him be like a star. And then you go into what everyone has to be able to do in order to be consistently good, which is go out there and invest in the free agent market. And you get Corey and Marcus and Yavaldi and you get Haney and you get, and you do have the ability to go out and trade for Max. I mean, because we have a, an ownership group that's invested and you, you've got to have that at some point to kind of like supplement everything else you do well, draft, develop, make good trades, uh, and then you got to be able to kind of punch in and, and get some really great players. And look, getting now we have the best middle infield in the game, and we went out and invested in free agency in order to get it. What about the ALCS for you guys? Was that just as big in a way as winning the World Series because you took down the big bad Astros in the state? That was crazy. Uh, it, from a like, again, from a fan's perspective, it's, it's really difficult to not get emotional, right? Because it's the, it is the Astros, and even though when I was a player, it was just that that ridiculous silver boot series because they were still a national league team so you're playing like the you know the you know the home and home rivalry series but it wasn't a rivalry right they're in the national league we're in the american league 
AJ was more of a rival with the Astros than we were because he played him in the World Series, right? We, we, it wasn't a rivalry for us, but now it's something different, right? They're competing for the same team. They're competing in the same division. Uh, their sparks flying, you know, guys are getting hit left and right and players are getting emotional. And as a fan, you kind of like dig that. You, you lean into it and just kind of enjoy it. I mean, did you, if I was you, did you celebrate? Cause here's the, I I mean, I know you said it was happy and sad, but like as a player, you celebrate different than you do as a front office personnel person. I mean, you still celebrate though, right? You still, I mean, you're still popping bottles. You're still, but it's not the same. That, yeah. I, I don't know. Explain that because as, I, I've never been through that situation. But as a, I know what it was like as a player and I was a front office person. Are yeah. you a little bit more like cautious on how much you celebrate? Yeah, for sure. I think I want to be like, I never want to, for, I never want to, I never want to be the guy. I mean, you, you saw it too. The guy who's like in the clubhouse, he's there overstaying his welcome. He's there too long. You say what's up. Next thing you know, he's sitting down next to you in your locker. I, I never want to be that guy. I want to say hello. I want to like congratulate guys. I'm playing well. I didn't get out. So during the, when they won, I'd go in there. I'd grab, I'd grab a beer, sit down, drink with the guys a little bit and, and, and celebrate. But I was never, I never wanted to be in their space in the clubhouse when they're, you know, dumping booze on each other. I, I just kind of wanted to stay out of that. I wanted to make sure that they had their space to celebrate uh, and they did and they deserved it. Uh, but for me, it was kind of cool just to sit back and watch that part of it. Uh, but, you know, when someone did kind of approach us, it was cheers and congratulations and the whole thing. But I want to also make sure that there is a line. You know, I'm a former player, not a current one, and I want to make sure I respect their space. Did you, did you like, Kinsler and AB go, like, in the back room and dump champagne on each other? Like, where no one was watching, you guys were like, hey, look at us, guys. <laughs> no, Nobody no, could see the, just, the, just us three. The, oh, dude, the funny part was, like, everyone, we, I'm looking for a couple of beers during the celebration. Service. Like, the beers are gone. I'm like, bullshit. This is a big league clubhouse. There's a stash somewhere. So, sure enough, you know, you go behind the weight room, take a little tunnel behind the training room, and next you know, you see this big, dusty-ass fridge. I'm like, there it is. It was like the, the, pot, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Sure enough, you open it up and the thing is just filled and stacked with beers. I'm like, it was here somewhere, man. We just had to dig for it. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I like that. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, when we look at a World Series title like this for the Rangers, do you think there will be teams that try and kind of copy any of the formula that you just went over, right? Um how do you think the league kind of shifts after a World Series championship like this for Texas? I know you mentioned, yeah, develop within, you know, every team realizes that at this point. Are there any market inefficiencies? Like you said, hey, we invested a lot of money into an infield that was the best in that, you know, you consider the best infield in baseball, championship infield. Is there a market inefficiency there to an extent where, you know, some teams will not dance in that playing ground anymore? Yeah, I think so. I think, well, I think the biggest thing is that I think teams are, it's going to be interesting to see how teams operate with, with more playoff teams, right? Do they think that they have a better chance to, to get into the playoffs? And especially this year when the teams that were in the bye, with the exception of the Astros, the teams that were in the bye round, the ones who had the most success. Um, I think that's something the league's really going to have to take a hard look at to see if that is something that's going to um, be uh, efficient going forward for teams that won. Uh, because I, I think now if you have teams that think that they can get in with the buy and have that kind of success, then yeah, hopefully we'll start to see, to see some teams invest in free agency. Because if you just get in, you've got a real shot. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, just my opinion, I don't think that the first round, say you like win your wild card round and then you go play the team that had a great year and had a buy. I think the team that just played has got a massive advantage. I don't think the team that had a buy is rusty, but I think the team that's, already won has built up momentum and the postseason is entirely about momentum. You want to get it, you want to keep it. If the other team's got it, you want to steal it back. So by the time that team that had a buy, whether it's, you know, the Braves, the Dodgers, the, you know, the um, brain cramp, Baltimore and Houston, yep. by the time they've even played, the other team has already had big moments. They've had big homers, they've had big punch outs, big plays on D's, they've celebrated, and they've dumped champagne on each other. By the time that other team's even thrown a pitch, that buy team has already done that or the first round team, excuse me, the wild card round team has already done that. So I think that there's a massive advantage there. And if teams feel like they can get into that round and they can maybe be aided by some free agency help, you know, hopefully teams will be more you know, incentivized to spend some money. It was a big topic of debate. Oh, I hate that. I hate that. I hate that. I hate the, oh, they we rested so we were rusty. Fuck that, man. <laughs> no, they're not rusty. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're supposed to be a better team. You're supposed to win. And it's never affected yeah. the Astros. It's affected a lot. And every, it's only yeah. the teams that lose. Because, listen – 
The Rangers and the Astros, when they played each other, the Rangers mm-hmm. had more time off before the LCS than the Astros did. True. So they should have been rusty and should have lost, right? Yes. The Diamondbacks had more time off than uh, the Phillies, and they won. So I mean, yeah. don't give me – don't give me that. I don't buy the rust I either. I, I agree with what you're saying, though, the momentum – in the moments, yeah. they've already that makes more. Now, if someone said, "Listen, we've already done this. We've already made some moments. We've already then that." I what he said, I agree with. But don't yeah. use the rusty excuse because sure. you know they, they went in to play the the Astros. You know, or, or no, sorry, excuse me. When they went in to play the Orioles, the Orioles lined up their pitching. They had Bradish, they had Kramer, they had all their guys lined up. Rodriguez, just how they wanted it, right? Where the Rangers were like, "Oh, we used Devaldi, we used sure, you know, we used all these guys, we used Montgomery." Oh no! How we can and they went in there and whooped their ass. It had nothing to do with rust. They just played better. Yep, sure, I totally agree. It's not to me. It's not a rust issue at all. There's no way you're rusty. For you don't even have a full week off, and you're going into the first round of the playoffs where everything is on the line. There's no way you're rusty. I just think the other, like I said, the other teams got built up momentum at that point, right? That that's that's all I'm saying. I don't I don't buy the rust thing at all. I totally agree with you on that front. So I think it's interesting what you mentioned about you know, how teams decide what they're going to do in terms of contending, because there are plenty of teams that are winning, you know, pretty consistently, like say the Dodgers, we can say the Braves now at this point, and they've got world series titles, both of them, but you know, that those fan bases, and even those front offices, when you talk to them, they're like, damn, we really feel like we should be going deeper into the postseason. Do you feel like, and maybe those teams aren't the best example, but based on what you're saying with wildcard clubs, I think there's some teams that are looking at it and saying, hey, this is an opportunity for us to be like, okay, or, or pretty good and still get in. And then it's a crapshoot. While other teams like yours just now said, hey, at the trade deadline, we're going to make sure that we don't have a pitching problem, that we don't have a, you know, a, a bullpen game in the postseason. Because even, you know, the game with Heaney pitching, that didn't end up being a bullpen game at all. That sure. was Andrew Heaney given, what, five innings or something like that. Right. So do you think there's any kind of science to contending at this point that the Rangers were able to do because you know the rebuild was there a little shorter than most teams you know um and then it turned into a championship I would say quicker than most people thought it would come yeah I think that's a good point I think that in order to just like anything else it's really not not scientific I think you have to really bolster your pitching side and uh, really establish depth uh when you're at the deadline the one team I mean Dodgers pitching was really really banged up um, even though they had a first round by going into that series against Arizona, I think that most people who watched them all year long is like, this could really go either way. Uh, just because the Dodgers were really, unfortunately, just beat up on the pitching side. The Braves, I think that that was one where it's like, I wouldn't overthink it on that end. Um, they ran into a hell of a Philly team who was like, at that point, remember when we were watching the Phillies at that point, they're probably, as most people thinking, the Phillies were the favorite to run the table. Uh, their ballpark looked like, but outside of the SEC football, the biggest home field advantage in sports. It looked like it was just crazy over there. The Phillies looked tough. Bryce is an animal, uh, the whole team. Uh, so I think the Braves just ran into that bit of a buzzsaw there. Um, again, with the Braves, they have a really, really good young pitching staff with Spencer Strider leading the way, who's just a machine. You have an unbelievable offense. I mean, it's really, really a good team. I, it's one of those unfortunate things where baseball happens. You know, a lot of times if you look at – that's one reason why baseball is so damn cool, right? Like in basketball uh, or even football, you know, if you're healthy in – in, ba- in basketball in a seven-game series, if you're healthy, the team with the best talent is generally going to win. Uh, in baseball, you know, upsets are much more likely to happen. And, you know, the Braves just got, got bit a little bit, but they're still a hell of a team. I wouldn't really overthink that one. Michael, do you want to manage one day? Are you happy in your role? Because you've been talked to, right? The Rangers have talked to you the last couple of times they've had openings. Do you want, is that something you want to do? I know we kind of joked about it a little bit earlier that, you know, the hours are too long and this and that, but is that something you might be interested in down the road? I don't think so. I think that I just really love the spot I'm in right now. Um, I love the idea of the work, you know, and I love the idea of even investing more time into front office work. I think that I love baseball. You know, I love being around it. I love being around a team environment. I love being around a competitive environment. Uh, but you know, it's man, the hours really are a beast, man. I got a, you know, I got a kid going to college next year. I got a uh, my son who plays ball is going to be a freshman next year. If, if you take on that job, I wouldn't see him unless I got lucky. I wouldn't see him play one high school baseball game, and that's not something I really want to sign up for. I want to be be there. I want to be involved. I want to see everything. Uh, so for for the time being, I just don't see that really being being in the cards for me. But in the future, um, who knows? Who knows? I mean, I, again, I I really love the game, and the idea of the work is is super appealing. 
I know you had mentioned in the past, you had spoken to the team about it, but didn't officially interview or anything in the past, right? So was it one of those like, hey, is there interest? Do you want to have a real combo? And you were like, nah, not right now. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty much exactly how it went down. They asked me if, if I was interested. I already had this job. Uh, they asked me if I was interested. I said no. Then I worked with them on trying to find a new guy. Um, you know, can, considering the guy we got now, uh, the idea of me even being a manager for the Rangers is pretty comical because the guy we got now is just... Uh, he might be the best ever. So um, it's pretty cool to sit back and watch him do his thing. Yeah, they had a good backup plan. It worked out really well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. Not right now? Okay, we're going to call Bochi. Okay, cool. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, what did you think of the contract for Craig Council and trying to raise the bar for managers because you know salaries had been lower, at least for some of the star managers, than they had been in the past? And did you buy into that narrative that, hey, if you're – a big deal manager, you should be making more than, you know, the last player on the roster. Yeah, I think so. I think that you look at this, at this deal, I think it completely reset the, the managerial you know, contract structure. Uh, I think at least for guys who have been a little more established, the young guys and the first, the first timers, they're going to kind of same as a player, right? They're gonna have to kind of earn their way up, but you have guys who are, you know, established guys. And like, to your point, it's look at what you're paying him in terms of the context of the whole organization. Uh, and I think we can all agree that if you have a manager who is, you know, the guy who's making these decisions and managing bullpens, which Boach does incredibly well, uh, putting guys in spots where they can do really well and winning championships, uh, they're going to be putting themselves in a the position to to make some some big dough, rightfully so. Um, I think, yeah, as a, as a team, it comes down to making super smart decisions because that's going to be part of your overall budget. Uh, but yeah, if you ask me, uh, I would absolutely be willing to, uh, you know, extend myself a bit for the right guy to to lead the team. Uh, being a manager is a lot tougher than people think. Nowadays, they always say it's all just about managing personalities. It's really not because you are going to get all of your like, you know, objective info from the R&D department before the game. And you've got it for me. You know, you've got to have a manager who can think on his feet during the game. You take that info, you absorb it, and then you got to be able to make changes as you see fit during the game. you got to be able to adjust just like a player does. You can't have anything inked in. You have to have a manager who can take that info, uh, you know, give it to his staff, give it to his players, and adjust on the fly if he needs to during the game. Uh, so that's an extremely valuable guy when it comes to winning. What Your ex-manager, my ex-manager, Ron Washington, just got the job with your division rival, the Angels. How do you think he's going to do? And people ask me all the time, what was it like playing for Wash? I say, Wash was great. He was he was up front. He told you where he stood. And he had the best meetings of all time. I know your boy <laughs> Kinsler and I would sit there, and Ian would just look at me while he's talking, and we would just bust out laughing. Uh, yeah. So tell me about Wash and how you think he's going to do in Anaheim. I love Wash, man. He's he's. I'm so happy for him. I know he's wanted to manage for a while. Um, but one thing I really respect about Wash, man, is that, like, you see guys who, who manage – Right. And they take time off. They don't want to go back and coach. They're like, all right, I'm a manager. I've established myself as a manager. This is what I do. And then maybe they get let go from their job and then they wait a couple more years and they kind of find another managerial opening and they go manage. Wash went, you know, didn't the job in Texas ended. And next thing you know, he's coaching in Oakland, back at it in a you know pool of sweat. And then he goes to Atlanta and he's coaching and all his infielders are raving about him. I mean, he, we, there's clips of him coaching opposing players in the All-Star game. I mean, the guy is just all about making people better. And then, so while he wants to get another managerial job, he's coaching, he's in the middle of it to try and make players better. And that's something that really grabs players' attention. You know what I mean? And so the guy like that, to me, really deserves a second opportunity to be another manager. Uh, usually when you have a team that's trying to turn things around, you're really kind of striving for energy guys, guys who are super competitive, guys who are motivated, who are hungry, who, like you said, AJ, like there's no bullshit. There's, he doesn't pull any punches. He gives you the honest truth. You know, Wash is kind of thought of in some baseball circles like this kind of like, you know, funny guy because he's always got a smile on his face. But he's extremely competitive, man, and winning means something to him. So, uh, I, again, I was super happy for him. Um, I think uh, I think he's going to do great. Uh, it's an in-division team, obviously. Uh, but from a personal side, uh, I, I couldn't be happier for the guy. So is the text like, hey, congratulations, and I can say this now because he's a free agent – we're going to try and take your best player. <laughs> so, <hey Otani. laughs> I mean, I, you know, first of all, watch this text is the best, right? He, he throws an exclamation point after every word. Hey, exclamation point. Mike, exclamation point. It's exclamation point. Wash. I'm like, dude, I got your fucking number. You don't got to tell me who it is. Like, you, so, but, and then one thing I love about Wash, though, if I text him, it's a phone call two seconds after. Like, he rarely texts back. 
it's always a phone call. Like he wants to hear your voice. He's one of he's one of those guys. Um, and I, I've always appreciated that. You know, every time I text him, it's it's a phone call right after. Um, regarding the Otani thing, I mean, that's that is straight above my my pay grade. That's an ownership call. Um, I think there's going to be a, a obviously a ton of teams that are going to be you know trying to figure out a way to to fit him into their budgets and to get him wrapped up for the next whatever ten to twelve years. Um, uh, I've never seen anything like this. You know, it's, it's the one th- way I can best describe Otani is that for all the great players we see in the game now, the Acunas and the Sotos and the Trouts and the Mookies, like we're going to see, I think, as time goes on, I think players just get better and better. I think we'll see those guys again at, in a different form in the next generation of players. I'm not convinced we'll ever see another Shohei. I think there's going to be guys who try and do the two-way thing, but I, never, I don't think we'll ever see anything like him again. This is super unique and uh, again, I, it, this is one of a kind. I think we got to enjoy it. Even taking, you know, your your Rangers um, front office hat off for a second, putting your player hat on. Is it fair for us as fans of the sport to root for him to be in a spot where he's going to be in the postseason? Because we can just look at recent history. Like he has not played a playoff game, and in your mind, for the health of the sport and the marketing of one of the best talents we'll ever see, maybe that we will ever see, and definitely the most unique that we've all ever seen. Is it a problem where he hasn't been in the postseason at all? Like, I mean, using the basketball example from earlier, like, and I use this a lot, LeBron's in the playoffs every year. We haven't had our best player showcased on a national slash international stage. 100%. I mean, we can try and, like, uh, you know, crank out the WBC is one of those things, but it's not. I mean, it, it, during the W, I coached this year on Team USA. It was a blast. But I've, I've heard players say, like, interviews during the WBC, what would you rather win, the WBC or the World Series? I'm like, how is that even a question? That's the dumbest question I've ever heard. It's that they don't even compare to each other, right? So, yes, to answer your question, we, the game is much, much healthier when the best players are on the biggest stages and October is the biggest stages, you know, you want players in September and October to be playing nothing but meaningful baseball. The second that, you know, we are in September when guys are, when teams are really making that final push into the playoffs, either to try and earn their spot in or to line themselves up to have the, you know, the, the most success, that's when you want to see the best players on the, on the biggest stage. So yeah, I, yeah, from a fan's perspective, absolutely. You want the best players playing in October. I, I think that's, it's necessary for the health of the game to have that happen. Okay, Michael, I, I got to go here. I was recently in St. Louis, the scene of the crime. 2011, I was there. <laughs> it's got to be one of the greatest the, – the, sorry, not the greatest. The, the most disappointing moments, right, of your career. You get that close twice, game six, two, one strike away, David Freeze and Lance Berkman, and David Freeze again. Can you just walk us through that as a player, what it's like, what you're feeling, and, and how you guys – you know, recovered from that. Yeah, it's, it's a helpless feeling, you know, like, um, you know, in baseball, there's so many things that are out of your hands, right? And, and you kind of just sit back and wait and hope everything else kind of goes well. But with that game, I mean, it's so easy to kind of go back and say, all right, what else could I have done to, to make this better? Adrian and Ian talked about that even the other night when the Rangers won it. Like, man, it's like, I think as time, you just kind of like, you get over it a little bit more. The sting never goes away. The pain of that will never go away. We'll take that one for the rest of our days. Um, that's just, you invest so much in your careers, right? And if that biggest moment, that defining moment in your career, it doesn't go the way you want it to go. That's something that never really goes away. But you know, over time you kind of just lean into being an adult and you figure out a way to kind of like brush it back and move on with your life. Right. But yeah, the, from a sports perspective, it, the, the pain doesn't really go away. But during that moment, I mean, you're just kind of like helpless, right? Like there's so many, like, I don't, I don't pitch. Right. Like, so you're just kind of like you, same thing. You just your fingers are crossed. You're hoping that thing just kind of goes our way. Um, at the end of the day, man, the the Cardinals executed when they had to. Um, that's really the only way you can look at it. Um, they when it, when the tank came time for them to execute, which is what the postseason is all about. They did it, and they get they get a ton of credit for that. I mean, as as it sucks um, from a competitive standpoint, but you know, as much as it hurts for them, you appreciate how much that must have meant to be on their side, right? Just that must have been a, a really sweet win for them. It's hard for me to stomach that. Um, but again, I mean, over time, you're kind of thankful for the journey that I've been to be on that team in the first place. And, um, you know, I wouldn't trade uniforms with anybody. That, those teams are really special to me. Always will be. Um, but yeah, that, that 11 team, that 11, 11 season ended was, was heartbreaking. There's no way around that.
I, I was there. It was it, – listen, that game six is one of the greatest games ever. I know you're on the yeah. wrong side of it. I'm sorry. But I was yeah. there. I was working for Fox at the time, and I was sitting out in left center field freezing my ass off so watching cool. that yeah. game. It was freezing, yeah. right? <laughs> so, uh, but I do have to – I, I want to know this because I played for the Rangers in 2013, a couple years after that. And there was a story, and I don't know if it's true or not, and Neftali Feliz was on, on the team then in 13. He was hurt most of the year, but he was still there. And there was a story that I heard, and it wasn't from a Rangers person. It was from other people that after – what was it? When David Freeze got the, the triple, uh, he was supposed to go out again for the next inning, which was the 10th, I believe. But he was right. too distraught in the tunnel that they – and I think you guys brought in maybe Darren Oliver. Or am I, I'm, I don't know. About, but because Felice couldn't go back out because he was so emotionally distraught? Yeah, I didn't I didn't see that. Kins and I were just talking about that. Um, you know, we thought he was all right. Uh, definitely still kind of like, you know, he just realized what happened, right? We had a chance to win the World Series and it didn't, didn't go. They scored two runs. Um, but the interesting thing about the 10th, man, is that – like you said, AJ, that game was wild. And there were – pinch hitters again this is before the dh were playing the national league ballpark so going into the 10th they had already burned through their bench right so they had two lefties coming up i think it was jay and descalso or maybe the other way around and then the pitcher was hitting in the third spot so all we got to do again they couldn't pinch hit for him right so basically a pinch hit maybe their best pitcher but we were going to face a pitcher so when nephi came out we were like we we didn't want him to go back out uh, but when ollie came came in we're like we're still in great shape because we have a guy who's done really well against lefties, and then we have the pitcher at the three hole. Sure enough, I think like one of them bounces a nine hopper through the right side, and the other one throws a lawn dart in the left field. And next thing you know, it's first and second, nobody out. And that's when we were like, "You have got to be shitting me!" Like the, the winning before was the one where Freeze went, Freeze hit the line drive off the right field, wall we'll scored two, and then Hamilton hits a two run homer. Now we have another two run lead going into the into the bottom of the tenth, and you know just. It's one thing if you know how it goes, man. It'd be one thing if it was like smoke double, smoke double, and you live with it, right? That's just it's part of the game. Uh, but the way that happened, you know, like uh, two balls that weren't hit terribly hard. Now their pitcher comes up, and now they're instead of their worst hitter, here comes their best bunner, and now it's second, third, and one out. It's just like you you can't you can't map this out. It's it was just a uh, a tough game in all in all respects, and some some freaky stuff happened. But again, they won. Um, they deserve it. They earned it. Uh, props to them, but yeah, it's it was a it was a wild wild game six for sure. And Lance Berkman didn't exactly hit a rocket, you know, late in that inning also to tie it again. It wasn't like he crushed yeah. it. I mean, he kind of hit a little jam shot up the middle too. So yeah, yeah, tough tough inning. Do you know the story? We had Chris Carpenter on here not long ago. Do you know the story about Game Seven? Remember, you guys got rained out between six and seven, and it never rained. You, you do you know the whole story that I was told? Have you heard this the story? Such- Bullshit. Yes, it's bullshit. Bullshit. The bullshit. Bud Selig story. <laughs> yes, yes. Everything that, you heard is true. Everything. See, you heard is I, true. I was listen. I was told by the the highest of the high people that would know in person. So I know it's true. But the oh, fact yeah. that you know you guys wouldn't have. I don't know who you guys would have faced for the Cardinals, but you guys were lined up, and they got to yeah. bring Carpenter back for Game Seven because Bud Selig didn't want to get on an airplane. Is yeah. the most unbelievable story I've ever heard. Yeah, and and. By the way, Carp is a stud. I mean, to, I think we faced him three times that series, and he came back on short rest in the end. And, like, usually when you face guys on short rest, you're like – and you face him your first at bat, you're like, damn, their stuff's down. It's a pretty special dude to have, like, the same stuff. And we faced him – I faced him in my first at bat game seven. I'm like, stuff's still there, man. He's, you know, rung sinkers and cutters and hooks still good. I mean, so, yeah, that was uh, – we got rained out before game six, actually. Uh, so that kind of like allowed them to line up carp carp through game five and game start game five and game seven because there was a rain out with not one drop of rain. Uh, yeah, but again, I mean that we can. Uh, this is Bud Sil- perspective, we can. Yeah, Bud Sil- Sil- didn't want to get on a plane. He didn't want to yeah. get on a plane because you guys might have won, and he was a chance it would have been rained out, so he would have had to spend a night in St. Louis. So instead, he's like, "Nope, we're canceling the game." Bang. Pushed it back a day. Yeah, sorry, it was before game six, whatever. And then yeah, they, yeah. the Cardinals won, and then they allowed him to pitch Carpenter game seven. That's a crazy amount of power. Nah, no, he's like, no. Yeah. And I swear, I promise you, I was in St. Louis. It didn't rain. I mean, not like not a, a little bit. It didn't rain a drop. I'm walking down the street drop. at 7 o'clock, and it's sunny out. You're like, how the fuck is it not playing? Well, how did that happen? <laughs> I mean, did, was there not... made the call. I know, there was a like... chance of rain. There was, there was like a 70% chance, right? Okay. And he was in Milwaukee. And he's like, nope, not going. Called his people and said, we're canceling the game because there's a chance of rain. And we were all like, yeah. what? It's not, it's, yeah. it's nice out. Like, we should play this. And the next night was fucking freezing. 
Yeah. Free. Yeah, next I mean, two it was, nights it was, it was wild. Yeah, super cold. Uh, Skip Schumacher is a good buddy of mine. He'll never, he never let. Anytime there's like rain, he'll like shoot a video like at his backyard. He's like, "What do you think about this? Is this rain or is this not rain? Just never ending, just needling you about that, about that series." <laughs> no, it's not. But you know what? Here's the thing too. Like as much as I always want to kind of like, I can think of a million things why you know shit didn't go our way. I mean, honestly, dude, that they, they won, and on and they won without Adam Wainwright, who was out for the year that year. I mean. Props to the Cardinals, man. If they had him, that's a whole different story for them, right? They so I'm not going to sit here and complain about you know anything else because they can sit there and say, man, we won without Wainwright, and they'd be right. During Game Seven, we were literally just kind of like talking amongst each other. I remember going to first base and you know talking to Albert at second base, talking to Rafael for call, being like, man, this is unbelievable. Like this is so sweet that we're a part of this. And it was like we were very aware during that series of how special it was. Obviously, would love the results to be different, but honestly, like. Now that I'm 12 years removed, uh, it, it ton of pride just to be a part of it. Um, it was it was it was pretty damn cool. By the way, with uh, your buddy Skip, you should send him a photo um, from the end of the season for him. He got pretty pissed off with the weather situation, so you do have finally a, a good text to send back. You, That's a good point. I, never, I wish I thought of that one myself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He did actually complain over and over and over again to me about that one about you know. The Mets uh, have a have a don't have necessarily a special place in his heart right now, but that's a good point. I never thought about that one. I'm gonna drop that one to him about ten minutes when we get off this. You got to wear him out. <laughs> Please yeah. do. You actually, there's a perfect picture. Actually, come to think of it, there's the picture of the grounds crew member taking the photo. Yeah, and he's yeah. like screaming at him. He's like yeah. screaming at him. Like he was pissed. finger out, pointing. It was out. brutal. Yeah, I remember play that. another game. You know, on yeah. what Monday yeah. that would have been. Yeah. 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 What, what yeah. did you think of the job that he did, you know, like, and what he said? I mean, I, th I think for me, you know, if I had a vote, easy manager of the year, in my mind, yeah. I know there's some other good candidates in the National League, but, you know, dude's working with limited resources, first year, expectations definitely were not that they're going to make the playoffs. And then right. he loses his two best starters, you know, later in the year. Right. I mean, just a great job. Honestly, like we, we talked earlier about like managing and, you know, who's a, he is perfect. Uh, he's such he he one he's he's earned his way there right he's coached he was a first base coach he was a bench coach he's been a couple of different organizations like he's earned his way he had a good playing career played for a long time uh one as a player uh, has been in the playoffs as a coach and now to to do this as a manager I'm, I'm not surprised at all um he's got an opportunity to do this for a long time be really really great at it uh but yeah like to your point i mean no one was expecting miami with all respect that to to do that especially to come out of the east right where Everybody's expecting the Mets to really make a ton of noise and for Miami to kind of sneak in there and, and, and take what a lot of people thought was going to be the Mets playoff spot kind of speaks volumes to their, the job their players did. And of course, the, the matter is always at the top of that thing. So I'm super happy for the guy. He's, he's a stud, man. He's going to be doing this for a long time. When you think back to your playing career of who you played with, like who are the people that stand out to you the most? And I, I mean that in a variety of ways. You can go anywhere here, right? Like from a talent perspective, from a personality perspective, because I'm looking back just on that 11 team alone, obviously, and, you know, Nelson Cruz and Hamilton, and we talked about Beltre, Andrew's still, you know, kicking in the league, you know, before that, A-Rod. So you you played with a lot of very interesting characters. Dude, yes, I did. I remember, like, my, my rookie year was 2001, and I got called up from AAA, like, in the middle of May, and <laughs> we had Alex was playing short, Pudge was behind the plate, obviously, Palmero. Juan, Ken Caminiti was our third baseman. Uh, Galarraga was our, our DH. It was a salty ass group that they dropped me into, man. <laughs> uh, but it was, but it was fun. I mean, that's the way you want to do it as a young player, right? You want to come up with those guys. And uh, I also, I have a ton of good memories of, of my time with, with, with those guys. I remember back my first game, we were in Baltimore. I was playing second base. Uh, Ripken was hitting. I think Mike Boric was on first. I'm dating myself right now, but uh <laughs> Ripken chops the ball to Cammy. There's less than two outs, so I come across the bag. But he chopped it like a trampoline ball, right? Like there's so in my mind, there's no way we're turning to. So I kind of like at second, I'm going to take the easy out, you know, and throw it back to the pitcher. Didn't know this at the time, but I think Ripken wiped out on the way to first. Didn't know he like got snipered on the way to first base. So I could have rolled. So I I catch the ball, kind of come off the bag. Border kind of tries to take me out. I move. I look down, and I already kind of banged it in my head. And Ripken 30 feet from the bag. And I couldn't like throw the ball. I already kind of shut it down mentally. I was like, first game. And I was like, oh, fuck. I look at Caminiti and he is like 
death staring me. And I'm like, of all the people to be on the bad side of my first game, right? So I go in the dugout after the after the inning is over. And I'm like, I feel I'm pretty bad. I already apologized to the starting pitcher. I was like, shit, my bad. It won't happen again. And Cam there, he sits by me. He goes, hey. He goes, did you think I was going to beat the shit out of you right there? I was like, I, I, I don't know. He's like, I fucking thought about it. <laughs> he gets up and he walks away. I'm like, this is the kind of shit that like, goes nonstop with like these guys. And, like, and it's, dude, what are you going to say to that guy, right? So anyway, but the, the beautiful part, it's like back in those days, like that would happen during the game. And the next day, your phone rings. At like 10, he's like, all right, let's go get lunch, right? Like it was always like, <laughs> take care of you the next day. You make a mistake, I'll let you know, then take care of you the following day. So um, that's like the personalities from my early years with the Rangers were like next level. It was, that was, that was a, that was the norm, that kind of stuff. But as I kind of got into my deeper in my years, kind of maybe I guess in the prime of my career and the, the players we had there, it was pretty amazing. Like I knew when we got Adrian that he was a good player. I had no idea he was that good. I had no idea. He was unbelievably great like prepared like saw tips from pitchers that other people didn't see it was uh hamilton is roy hobbs like i never saw a more natural guy more naturally fit to play baseball than him uh ken's just a complete like grinder it was it was a fun 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 group so it went from like these really interesting characters really in my career to like this team that was built around winning later in my career that was a lot of fun to be around did you think um, A Rod would end up in this spot right now? Like, I mean, you had him pretty, uh, uh, not completely <laughs> early, right? You didn't have him Seattle days, but you had him like, I guess, kind of prime the massive contract. Yeah. You know, there, there was a lot of drama in his life after that. There was a World Series title, and now he's like a big TV personality and one of the voices of the game. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I had him all three. My rookie year was his first year in Texas, so I was I played with him all three years. Um, no, I don't think anybody could have kind of predicted this. That's like a pretty massive turnaround. I don't think any, I mean, it went from, you know, obviously there was, you know, the, the, a lot of the drama later, later in, later in New York and, you know, got suspended, came back and then to kind of go out of the game and come back like this and have, like, like you're right. It's one of like, you know, pre and post game for World Series and then Alex is there along with David and Derek. Like David and Derek are like two of the, you know, they're icons in the game, right? They're Hall of Famers. They've played for massive franchises, having like huge success. And Alex is right there with them. Uh, so, you know, it was, it's super unpredictable. I never would have thought about it. When I was in Texas, yes, that I, I could have seen that happening. But considering everything that happened in New York, yeah, that's, I don't think anyone could have saw this one coming. But um, yeah, he's doing well. Yeah, good for him. Yeah, no, I agree. It's crazy. If you had, there were certain times in his career where if you told me that he would be on that desk, I'm like, what? No freaking way. I will bet you anything. Is there anyone I mean, else? Yeah, uh, go ahead. I want to hear I more. I, I, I want to hear this because this is I'll great. This is deep I'll down. I, I, yeah. I, I, no, you couldn't yeah. have predicted it, right? I mean, I've. Yeah. No. No, no, you couldn't have predicted it. No. <laughs> there was says, yeah, David Ortiz is going to be on the thing. Of course he is. Everyone loves David. Man, the guy comes up to you, he gives you a bear hug for 10 minutes, and it feels like super genuine every time, right? Like, it's David. And then Derek is Derek, right? I mean, you don't have to say anything else, right? But um, it's, it's, it's wild. It's, it's, but again, like, this is, the, the, this is what in this game, in this sport, like, there's always endless opportunities to, to make something of yourself. So he's definitely capitalizing on that right now. Hey, wh where are you in your house? Because I don't see one baseball anything in your house. Did you do you hide it all? Yeah, it's kind of in the other side of the house. Yeah, this oh, is the like, other. It's in the other wing. My... Shit. Um, <laughs> I'm actually I'm actually selling this house. I'm moving right now, but uh, this is where my kids do homework right now. This is where they where the, the most quiet part of the house. <laughs> so we were we were teammates one time, Michael Young and I, 2006 mm -hmm. All Star game. All Star. Yeah, game. I think he has a pretty fun memory of that game. Do you yeah. do you remember what you did in that game? Hell yeah, man. That was a fun. That was honestly, that was uh, not because of that, what happened in the ninth inning, but that was a super fun all star game for me because honestly, I remember like you guys were the first of all, there was a shitload of White Sox there because you guys were just coming off the World Series. Ozzy was the manager, and I always got along great with Ozzy. Uh, I don't know why. Like, I, we, it's not like I played, we played the White Sox very often. They're out of division team. For some reason, I always got along well with Ozzy. And even like from a, I always got along well with AJ, right? Like, uh, you know, and I remember that 06 team that they had, I actually thought they were, I thought they were better than the team that won the World Series yeah. the year before. Because I think that was Tommy's first year yeah. there, I think, right? Yeah, we had Tommy, we traded for Javi Vasquez. Yeah, yeah we had a, and it had a good team. It was a whip of a team. Jose Contreras, by the way, was a monster of an at-bat for a right-handed hitter. That was a nightmare. Jermaine Dye was a great player. Canerco, obviously. I mean, 
it was a it was a super super good team and there was a ton of white Sox there i had a, i had a really good time and because ozzy was the manager there was like always just this really super fun vibe and i remember even before the game during the game in the dugout it was a really really fun game a cool cool ballpark in pittsburgh um but yeah i, I had a good time man I, I i enjoyed that game a lot um and you know honestly i had a good moment in the ninth inning and 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 PK is a, to thank for that because he's the one who I was in the hole with two outs and nobody on. And PK was got, got a little start with the base hit to left field, and I never would have gotten that bad if he didn't come through. Yeah, well, I'm glad you got that hit. If people that don't know, I think it was off. It was off Trevor Hoffman, wasn't he? Hit a yeah. triple to right center, scored yeah. two runs. We won the game. I'm very happy because I was the only one that Ozzy told before the game, "You're not going to play." Because we had played 19 <laughs> innings, so I was kind of intoxicated in the game, <laughs> and so he comes up to me. And he says to me, he says, hey, if we tie it and we get, you know, too far, you're going to have to play. And I'm like, hell no, I ain't play. I can't play. There's no play way what? I can play. Yeah, I'm like, exactly, exactly. I'm like, do what? He's like, you might have to get in it back because it was National League. And it was, you know, he's like, you know, if we need a pinch hitter, you're the last guy we got left. And I'm like, okay, let's – come on, Michael. Let's go, Michael. And you got the hit. And I was so – I was like, oh, thank God. You got that hit. You would have had to go full Mark Burley right there, dude. Oh, man, no kidding. I was – oh, it would have been bad. But I, mean, I would have swung three times and gone back to the dugout happy. So, yeah. What, you, do you win a car for that MVP? Yeah, dude, I, I gave the truck to my dad. He still has it. That's awesome. Still has it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, awesome. drives it around. Yeah. Yeah. That's it was great. pretty cool. A so, cool moment, man. It was um, – you know, it's an all-star game. It's not, you know, that big in the grand scheme of things. But um, it was a cool moment, man. It was, it was, it was fun. All right, so last one for me, biggest individual accomplishment, because you're allowed to do that, obviously, after you play. Guys are always shying away from it when they do play. But, you know, that's one. What, what was the, you know, either award or a single game? It could be anything, you know, for a season that stood out to you the most. Um, oh, man, that's a tough one. I honestly don't really, even now, you don't really give too much thought to that when you're playing, even less now. But it's not as big a deal as it, as it was, you know, now as it was then but when the batting title 2005 was a big deal to me uh i i you know being in a being working in front office now it's a lot of fun because i think that there a lot of times between analytic stuff and non-analytic stuff i think a lot of it's too much is made of that i think honestly most at least my experience in this organization everyone's in lockstep everyone recognizes what's important and what's not and people who kind of say that batting average isn't important i'll fight them on that one all day long and that was a big deal to me. You know, it was one of the, I remember in, in September and, and Alex and Vladdy and I think Johnny Damon were behind me. And uh, I remember, you know, you know how it is when the media asks you like about that stuff. You're like, oh, you know, I just want to keep winning. And I don't really care about that. And they would ask me like middle of September, you know, how do you feel? I'm like, oh, no, I, I definitely want to win. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you guys. Like it was, the batting title is a big deal. You know, I remember like my favorite players growing up won batting titles and, uh, so that was a really cool moment, and even when the, the end of the season, when that thing, when I kind of locked that thing up, and it was a, it was a really, really proud, proud moment for me because it was, you know, it's a whole season thing, and it was something I always kind of set my eyes that I wanted to do, and to to wrestle it down and win one was it meant a lot. It was it, uh, you know, to me again, even now, batting average is not an under overrated stat. I think it's, you know, whenever you're playing, and and if I'm playing defense or if AJ's catching, you know exactly when the three thirty hitters coming up. You know, you, you have an idea of it and you want to make sure guys are on base for that guy when he gets up there. So, um, yeah, that was, it was definitely a proud moment for me from an individual perspective, for sure. Hey, listen, as a catcher, you always know when the guy hitting 330 is coming up. I'm not I'm not studying their OPS. What's their, How many times they walk this year? No, no, no. Who's the dude that can get the hit in the ninth inning off my closer and cost us the game? Those are the guys I was looking out for. But I, I figured out how important batting average was to you because you retired at 300. And you knew if you played one more year, there's a chance you could go to like 299. So, Michael, you were like, nope, that's it. I'm done. I'm hitting 300 on the nose. See you later, baseball. Thank you. <laughs> Dude, everybody's like, everybody's like, how do you feel? I'm like, well, you know, my knee hurts, my shoulder hurts, and, you know, you know, I, I, I'm, my contract's up. You know, I'm very, very blessed. Da, da, da. I'm like, and I have a 300 average, and I'm ready to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you wish you could say that sometimes in interviews, though? Oh, dude, listen. He, I, he's, he's joking, but listen. <laughs> He, I promise you, there was a piece of his in his head that was like, "Wait a minute, I'm right at 300, not 302, or it could go. You know, I could have a little bit of a down year and hit 270 and it fall yeah. to 301, but I'm at 300 on the nose. Fuck that. I, listen, <laughs> I respect you more, dude. Forget that. Listen, at the end of my career, I, I was 280, and I was like, "Fuck!" I was counting it down. They're like. Oh my God! If I go like over four, I might go under two eighty. Fuck that, dude! I'm done. I don't want to play no more. 
That's for sure, dude. I mean, I mean, that's I. It wasn't like a, at the at the top of my you know priority list, and I was deciding if Chris Carter no. offered me another deal to come back. But like, is it a factor? Hell yeah, it's a factor, man. Like you you work hard in your career, and you want to make sure you protect the things that you busted your ass for. You know, so uh, you know again, it was something that I was aware of. Um, but you know, it's funny too, AJ. Like when you're even it's even at the end of my career, I would have been going to year like fifteen if I had played again, and I was like. Yeah, I can retire now and get 300. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can go out there and hit 300, 310 again. Totally fooling myself at that point. I could do that, man. Was, I just, I had two years in a row where I was in the, you know, I think under 280. And, and I'm like, yeah, those days are probably behind me now. You know, I don't know if I can kind of flip the switch and go back to hitting 310. That's, that's a pretty tall, tall order. So, um, yeah, no, no doubt, dude. Like being able to retire with a three in front of my batting average is, is something I was. Hey, get that foot down. Get that foot down, Rudy Jaramillo style. Get that foot down early. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. That was, you know, it's funny. I talked to Canerco about that a lot. That guy loved talking hitting. Every time I go to first base, oh. we played you guys. He oh. would love talking hitting. He's like, you ever feel like you're sacrificing power, like to, to do that? And I was like, yeah, I was like, with two, but I was like, I was striking out too much, man. I was like, and with two strikes, I just, I didn't like that, you know, especially with guys in scoring position. Like, what am I doing if I'm striking out? And that was like in my third year of my career, I was like, I got to try something different. And I took out the rest of my career with two strikes. I just like, I'm not, will I sacrifice the ability to drive the ball with two strikes? Yeah. But with a guy in second base, I don't care. Like, I want to get him in, and I stuck with it. Yeah. Tell Canerco, fuck off. You hit 300, he had 400 homers. Which one do you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, he probably did both, didn't he? Uh, I know he didn't hit 300, but he could he, – okay. he, he, listen, he, he would do it. Don't let him fool you. He would – there was never a player I played with more that would sacrifice himself with two strikes to, like, get a guy over. Like, there was a runner on second and two out, uh, no outs. I mean, he would get blown up and hit like the weakest ground ball you've ever seen at second base, and be so happy about it. He was he was one of the best. Yeah, man, I I, I kind of miss that part. Again, I think the game is in great hands. I'm not being one of those guys that bitches about the game nowadays. I think it's a hell of a game. The guys are super talented. But I remember when I played with Juan Gonzalez, like he was like a gigantic human, and he hit balls on the moon. But you put a guy like on second base with him and like two outs, and he became a different hitter. He's like, I'm knocking in this run. If I get jammed, I don't care. Like, I, this run's coming in. And even like, I remember, um, you know, when, when I played with Alex, we were facing, uh, you know, Tim Wakefield one. I never forget this, you know, rest in peace to Wake. But like, they shifted him. And this was like rare. It didn't happen. You know, they, they put the second base way over there. And Alex like stepped out and he was like offended. He was like, fuck that. And he took, he had a base hit in the right, right? And he's like, dude, like I'm an all around hitter. Like, and that was kind of like, I point to Alex because I think a lot of the really good hitters were like that back then. Like they took it like personally, if you felt like you couldn't shift anything. And nowadays guys just don't have the mentality. I'm not saying which one's better or worse. And I'm not saying that, you know, hitting a ball the right side off a knuckleballer is obviously easier than doing a guy who's throwing a hundred, right? It's a little, little easier, but I mean, I just think that, especially with guys in scoring position and, and I have no problem with guys who are super gifted trying to like drive balls and like knocking runs in big ways by hitting homers. It's no problem. It's part of their game. But I do think there's a way to kind of like, you know, I see with the Rangers, man, that they, they found Corey Seager is a phenomenal hitter. But I think above all, he kind of probably sees himself as a guy who like knocks and runs. Right. And if there's a way to do it with the base hit because you're facing the, a pitcher who's got who's got you behind in the count or who's just maybe you're not seeing very well and you have to figure out a way to get that run in. It's by all means necessary. And he's a great answer on Immaculate Grid. Remember, we, we used Michael once for 300. Yeah, because people forget he played for the Phillies and the Dodgers. Everyone just assumes he's a 300 he's a career hitter. 300 career hunter. Phillies. Yeah. You know? Or like, Dodgers. Dodgers. <laughs> Some good answers there. Well, Michael, this was awesome, man. It was great to have you on. Congrats, obviously, again, on, on the World Series title with the front office. And uh, yeah, we appreciate the time, dude. Thanks, guys, man. Enjoyed it. Anytime.